Right. So I'm going to get into starting the program and the first session, I've got to say, um, I feel quite, um, you know, chuffed to have someone like this that opens up our 2013, her 2013's Barry Irvin. Uh, someone has a, a fair bit on his plate, obviously, as we most know him as executive chairman of Bigger Cheese, which seems to have suddenly become a somewhat bigger job than when it was um, a little cooperative in um, Bigger Valley. The other aspect that um, perhaps isn't um, highlighted, and to me, I had the pleasure of listening to him speak at a, at a function a little while ago, was he's also chairman of an organisation called Giant Steps. And I think sometimes um, if you're having a discussion with Barry, I think it would be really worth asking the questions about Giant Steps because you can read about Bega, but Giant Steps is such an incredibly important organisation that, that Barry contributes to. So Bega, Barry is executive chairman of Bega Cheese. It's one of now one of the largest dairy and food companies in, a, in Australia, revenues over three billion. As I said, from a small cooperative in the Bega Valley to now having 20 sites across Australia, not only providing wonderful product to Australia and bringing a few back into the backyard, but also to 40 countries, and it is also on the ASX. Barry grew up on his dairy farm, his family dairy farm, which now his son operates, and Andrew is a sixth-generation farmer in the Bega Valley. The long history of farming has meant that Barry has had a particular interest in sustainable agricultural production and championed a number of environmentally focused projects. Most recently, Barry has led the establishment of a regional circularity cooperative with the ambition of making the Vega, Vega Valley the most circular region in the world. Barry has always believed in giving back to the community and is a long-term chairman of Giant Steps, as I explained, and that organisation provides services to children and adults with autism. I'd like to welcome Barry to the stage to present what does sustainability mean? Hi everyone, um, really nice to see you and nice to see many of you last night. Uh, maybe before I start, so um, I have drove into the centre of Bendigo this morning because I like to walk. So I had to wander around Bendigo, found where all the best pubs were, found an atrium in the middle of the gardens that doesn't look like it gets as much use as it used to. Um, observed that there, fair, there was a few cranes and a bit of building going on. I thought all good signs. Town looks reasonably vibrant. Good sign overall. I walk a lot. Um, I tend, to, I tend to try and walk across countries. Um, and some people think that's because I'm slightly crazy or indeed very crazy. And, but it's actually not. It's because when I walk, I get time. I get time to observe, time to listen, time to, time to think, um, time to understand. I think it's extraordinarily important. I hadn't thought too much, but when I talked to my son Andrew as he's zipping across the farm on his motorbike, for somebody like me, this will sound strange, but I'm forever telling him to slow down when he's on his bike, not because I'm worried about his safety, but because I want him to see more. And, you know, we were talking last night, I'm the... I'm, I'm very much the last generation of stock horsemen that, that, that you, you just had horses, not motorbikes on your farm, and you rode everywhere. Um, but you saw more, and you fixed more, and you thought more. And so what I keep trying to say to Andrew, you know, hasten slowly, hasten slowly. So always, always be looking for efficiency, always be looking for how you move fast, but hasten slowly because you'll actually save time. You'll actually save time. So... I like, to, I like to talk, I like to walk, and I like to listen. And I like to, I like to, to, to be around people that have more knowledge than me. That's why you mostly find me in the bar at the end of most functions, having a scotch. Because my job, funny enough, isn't to have the answers, it's to have the questions. 
It's to make sure that I am asking the key questions and surrounding myself with people that are experts in their field and then assessing all that they tell me and deciding which buttons to press, to press and, and how to move forward. Now, inevitably, the next morning after a chat in the bar, I always think, David Nation, I did not need that last scotch. Thank you, David, for the for shouting, but I did not need that last scotch and I regretted it the minute, I, the minute I woke up this morning. But beyond that, that was the only thing I regretted because it was nice to have the chat and nice to hear perspective. So, so I reflected a little bit on on even the presentation last night when people were talking about the size of a computer in 1983 compared to, the, to what you carry around in your pocket today. The interesting thing about that isn't the advancement. The interesting thing about that is that we knew it would happen. We didn't necessarily talk about it, but we knew it would happen because Gordon Moore so for those in the room that, 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 that might have vague interest in strange facts, Gordon Moore in 1965 coined Moore's Law, which still stands to this day, which basically said that on average a, a transistor will double its capacity on, an inter, on a given integrated circuit every two years. And guess what? It did. And if you keep doubling something every two years, see how fast it advances or how far it goes. So we always knew, even though we didn't talk about it, that we would eventually have a computer more powerful than the one that was in Apollo 11 that took, the, took, took man to the moon in our pocket, in our pocket. And we knew it, but we didn't necessarily talk about it and we didn't actually look to extrapolate out what that might look like. What we didn't know is how humans would interact with that device. What we didn't know is that the next generation's concentration span would be reduced to five minutes. What we didn't know is that government would find it really difficult to govern because the news cycle was reduced to moments and reduced to three lines. All of those things mean that you have to be agile and you have to adapt to human behaviour. The funny thing that is predictable, so when people talk to me about, um, gosh, the world's changed, hasn't it? You know, look at, the, look at, look at what's happened to farm gate milk price and look, what, look what's happened around the globe um, and, and all these things you could have never foreseen. Most of them you can. Most of them you can if you spend the time listening, looking, learning, surrounding yourself with people that know and genuinely listening. So from my perspective, I'll just, um, I'll just make it worse for you by waiting. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, Sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. Um, so, 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 so for me, it is, it is about making sure you surround yourself with the right people, with the right knowledge, and you'll be surprised. So how do you manage risk with knowledge? That's how you manage risk. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you manage change with knowledge? It's really important that... And, and, and I should say knowledge comes from everywhere. As much as I'm saying surround yourself with exports, listen to everybody. And one of the most important things you can do is listen to the community. So at the moment, I think farmers, particularly um, people like ourselves that manage uh, cattle, would be concerned about what community expectation might be of us and, and, and even feel like the community is not well informed. Um, that's okay, we've still got to listen to the community. You cannot, you cannot put up a wall and say they're wrong, I'll therefore go along without them. The funny thing is that if you don't listen to community expectation, either because they're your customer or because they're a stakeholder of some sort, if that community expectation remains the same, it moves from being an expectation that, um, that the community has to a legislation that government brings down. So my, my task in life always has been to listen to community expectation. So I can, I can 
be ahead of change or I can manage change and I can manage risk. So where do I, where do I start when I think about that? Well, now I go big, right? So, so, so we, we start small, but we go big. As we wander the world, what do we learn? Well, at the moment, and this is a KPMG slide, right? And I, and I won't bother going through the detail of it, but what it's basically saying is that if we valued the natural resource we used, what would that be worth around the globe? The answer is about $125 trillion. So we are large managers of that natural capital. It's a very large resource. When we think about the change that's coming, it's already here and with us, and the next speaker will speak a little bit more about it in detail. But the truth is, we have to recognise that opportunity around natural capital. And we have to recognise that it will lead to some change practice, but it is one of the biggest opportunities that I've ever witnessed in agriculture. So while on the one hand, you might be worried that community expectation is, is, is a little harsh and ill-informed, on the other hand, community expectation is causing natural capital to be valued. And, it's, and, and when that valuation is done, the number is huge, therefore the opportunity is huge. The interesting thing around net zero targets and those types of things is that, is that even when they deal with all the energy, even if we get to 100% renewables, we will only deal with 55% of the challenge. The other 45% has got to come from circularity, which is why I've started to move down the path of, of circularity. But before I go there and talk about what's going on, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the bigger valley. I think, it, again, it is important to have a global perspective. So this is a Rabo slide, a Rabo bank, wonderful bank. So here's our challenge. We've got to think about the globe in terms of food and energy and how we deliver it in an you know, in available, affordable, nutritional, efficient way with net zero emissions. And that's only one of the issues around circularity, because trust me, if we just deal with one, um, we will still have lots and lots and lots of problems. So it's an extraordinary circumstance that we live in. And this morning we wake up and go, I've walked across um, Georgia and I've looked into the Caspian Sea and I've walked across Bulgaria on the other side of the Caspian Sea. And there's a drone, there's an American drone at the bottom of the Caspian Sea today that they're blaming the Russians for shooting down. How important is that? Not sure. Not sure, but we need to be really aware of, you know, we've now got, we're back with great power struggles. We're back with um, all the isms, militarism, nationalism. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat um, concerning. You would not have thought 20 years ago that we would be talking about the sorts of things that, that we are talking about today. We thought that belonged in the Cold War era. Well, it's beginning to come back. And we need to think about that as we think about how we set our own businesses and indeed who we align with. But, you know, when I wake up in the morning, what do I think about? Most of these things. Most of these things. I think about them in the perspective of my business, but I, but I think about them in terms of how I set myself for the future, the next, the next 10 to 15 years. I'm not going to dwell too much. This is the growth of Bega since, since, I, since I, I took leadership. I don't really think that numbers matter that much, except to illustrate purpose, except to illustrate the fact that um, you can have a dream from a small valley on the south coast of New South Wales to build a powerhouse Australian dairy and food company. Guess what? It won't be easy. There'll be challenges over time. Um, you'll, you, you, you'll, you'll impress some people, you'll disappoint others. But having a vision and a dream is extraordinarily important, and that's what we've tried to execute. One of, the, one of the reasons why it's important to execute it is that you get the flexibility and the freedom to operate. You get the flexibility to make change at size and scale, which you cannot necessarily make um, if you are small. And you all know where Bega is, I hope. I'm sure you, some of you visit for a holiday. It's famous for surf and cheese. We want to make it famous for something else. But the reality of, of 
the bigger group now is that we have dairy sites and food sites across the country, again, from small things, that saying from little things grow. Uh, big thing, from little things, big things grow is, is, is really uh, well illustrated by what we've been able to achieve out of our tiny little cooperative where I was the 62nd employee. There's now 4,200 odd. Um, unfortunately, I don't know all their names, which upsets me no end, but um, I used to pride myself on knowing all our staff's names and all our, and all our customers' names and all our suppliers' names, but we deliver to 40,000 customers a week. Um, across the country and across the world, um, a variety of products. Of course, we're very fat, proud of our brand, but the only reason why I put this up is that somebody actually asked me whether I wanted to own breakfast. And the answer is yes, I do. Uh, I'd like to own more than breakfast, but the truth is, um, I just, I'm really putting this slide up to say we're really proud of that brand portfolio. You know, it, um, people tend to talk about Vegemite as that Australian icon that was in foreign ownership for 90 odd years before Bega was able to bring it back to Australia. Many others had tried. Um, but the bottom line here really is that um, if you're not eating one of our products for breakfast, I'm not ever speaking to you again. That's, that's, that was. <laughs> That was all really I wanted that slide for. The, um, the, the bigger group obviously takes seriously what community expectation is, what all its stakeholder expectations might be, and of course m have made similar commitments that many other companies make around carbon targets, 50% uh, reduction by 2030, and a, uh, uh, and a net zero by 2050. We align ourselves to the UN sustainability goals sustainable development goals, um, as many people in our industry do across the world. Um, interestingly, if we stop there, that would only get us close to community expectation. It wouldn't get us beyond community expectation. So we, we started to use the language that indeed was language that was strongly coming out of the Netherlands around circularity. And if you're going to talk about a significant change in behaviour, if you're going to need to bring the whole community along, um, you better have um, some level of capacity and influence. So, so look, there's lots, of, there's lots of definitions of circularity, and there's one a little bit later in the pack, but I'll run out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a really simple way. So it's really in terms of our, our supply chain, what can you refuse? So what can you not use of your current resources because there's something that's renewable? So then what's in, what's out, and then what you, what you must use that, that um, is, not, is not ultimately recyclable at the end, um, how long can you keep that in the economic supply chain? So how long can you keep reusing something before, before you end up uh, having to dispose of it? And then how do you dispose of it? It's a wicked problem. So you know, when you, even when you think about renewables, you think about an electric car, it's not, all, it's not all beer and skittles. What they're using to create it is an enormous resource. When, when it's run out of life, it's a, it's a pretty big disposable problem. So almost, even, even the best of things around, around sustainability have challenges. And again, that's not, that's not a criticism. It is, it is just the fact that you need, you need to have a very open mind when you start to embrace something like circularity. The most important thing about circularity, and you can see down there the targets that we've picked up, so it's not just about emissions, it's about biodiversity, it's about soil, it's about water, it's about waste generation and repurposing, it's about packaging and logistics, animal welfare, the economy and society. So it is, so it is, it is the true wicked problem as you go, we will create the most circular valley in the world, in the bigger valley. Um, there's a definition, but you feel free to get these slides. How did this come about? Why would, why would I think that I, I, I can do this? The bottom line is Rabobank came to me and said, you're our scope three. Every farm in the world is Rabobank scope three that they fund. That means that it, there'll be a point in history where if we're not doing what we need to do, they may not be able to fund us. 
The term circularity, believe me, will become the language. It will become the language that you need to get used to over the next five years. So we agreed with Rabobank and KPMG that we would begin um, a, a, a case study and we might as well begin it at our two factories, our two traditional factories in Bega, where we can ask the staff to do a lot of discretionary effort to do training to become adept with circularity, to identify programs that they can introduce within the factories uh, to improve our to improve our sustainability footprint, to embrace circularity. We did workshops and training over two or three days. The staff had to do it in their own time. They then had to, they then had to um, um, identify projects, present them up to ourselves, then we, then we approved them and, and enacted them. The night, I was so impressed that we had, had you know, 40 odd staff just to vol volunteer to do this work. So I had them all out to my place and we're standing on the veranda and I'm with the trainers from Rabobank and the trainers from KPMG looking out across the valley and I said, this is great, not going to make a difference, but great. I said, if we really wanted to make a difference, we need to turn the whole valley circular. This is an enclosed catchment. We need to be the proof of concept that others can follow which is interesting enough why I created a cooperative, because this is not IP. I want to create wonderful IP and give it away, because I want, there's no good in this battle, there's no good you winning and everybody else losing. Everybody has to win. Everybody has to move forward together or we don't solve the problem. So we decided, and I won't go into detail of, of, of why the Bega Valley makes sense, but it is an enclosed catchment and with only two roads in and out with a diversity of, of enterprise from horticulture to, to animal agriculture right through to the most famous oysters and fisheries and, and everything in between. So because it's an enclosed catchment, you can measure everything. If you can't measure it, you can't demonstrate improvement. You can't do the proof of concepts we wanted. So we began the process of pulling together um, a circular plan and then creating a cooperative. And we said we need to deal with each of those 10 items and we need to have horizons and plans as to what will look like and what the valley will look like in, in 10 years' time. Uh, again, extraordinarily ambitious, but the bigger valley had a couple of advantages, including Art Singular Council. Who's deeply involved with this? The state government, because it deals with most of your daily life. Local government, because it deals with most of your waste. Business and community. They're all involved because they, they and, and the advantage that the Bega Valley has is we only have one council. So in that enclosed catchment, we can operate with one council as we, as we look to, it, to, to institute change. Lots and lots and lots of partners. So Rabobank, KPMG, as you would accept, expect, state government, local government, uh, AACO, Australia's largest uh, landholder, two universities, um, so many people outside the valley that we can bring in to create a steering committee that identifies problems and then uses their global network to find solutions on each of them. First thing we're going to do is build a national circularity centre. Uh, I should say, thanks to the state government, who's given us $14 million to start the project off, with another five odd million coming from Bega. Um, this, this will become the education centre for sustainable agriculture. So one of the things that I'm very aware of is that even when we have tourists from the metropolitan areas going into the regions, they don't necessarily learn about food production, they don't necessarily learn about agriculture, they don't necessarily learn about sustainability. We need to make it real and live to them the way Uber made the, the car arriving to pick you up real and live because Uber is not a nice company, but it's a trusted company because of the technology they use. Where was that trust lost? Well, taxis that told you they'd be there in five minutes and never turned up or turned up half an hour late. So technology actually allowed you to build trust. So we're, NBN is involved with this project because we're going to sensorise the entire valley and deliver you that data through the National Circularity Centre, which will also have a digital twin. 
that will, that will deliver you the information around food production in the valley in real time. So you will be able to see how much carbon was sequestered across the valley, how much carbon was, was created across the valley. You'll be able to see how much water was used, what food was produced, what travelled where, all in real time while we can tell how much water was stored. We, can, we, we, we will be able to communicate with our consumer and once we have them learning about that in the valley, they can take a digital twin of that centre away with them and look at it any time they like because we want to build back. So Australian consumers have a great trust in farmers but they question their sustainability practices. So we want to build back that trust that we are very, very, very careful and good land stewards and very, very careful, good sustainability managers. And we better do it the way Gordon Moore told me I'd do it in 1965. We better do it by using what the average Australian is going to use into the future and we better be ready to do it. So that's, that's, that's one of our first projects off the ranks. I've put a whole lot of slides in here um, because, as you can imagine, there are a whole lot of priority projects around base lighting. Uh, natural, natural capital trading is something I started with and, I, and perhaps I'll start to move to end with. I've got to say that as I look at natural capital and its trading, I say to my farmers, look, it reminds me a bit of the broking era where the brokers were making a lot of money and not taking much risk and the risk sat with, with others. So I'm very worried about the commercial operators that are out there taking big chunks of dollars to manage your natural capital um, and not necessarily giving you advice that is in your interest, so they're giving you advice that is in their interest. So we've created a cooperative that will be the aggregator, that will be the honest broker we won't be the trader, but we'll be the person that you can be sure of. We'll be talking to you about, you know what, biodiversity credits might be something that's good for you, but you better keep your carbon credits or whatever else it might be. But we won't be interested in making money out of a farmer's natural capital. That's not, that will not be our game. We'll be interested in the sustainability of that farm and how it moves forward and how we can advise them. So we've got a whole series of projects look i put them in here because i thought if people asked for the slides they could that they they, they they would see the variety of slides that are there it is worth saying that um, this has already been recognized in new york by the un food system summit as a uh, as a potential global game changer so for us for our world it's about proving that you can create a fully circular economy in the Bega Valley, sharing those fast proofs of concept as we get them with other regions, uh, helping farmers make the change, um, and then for once having practices in Australia taken to the world. So rather than Australia being accused of being a poor environmental manager, we want to be the place where people come from around the world to learn about um, circularity and sustainability. I will stop there because I, as usual, I talk too long. I think I'd probably leave you with two things. There was always that old saying that the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Um, so that's the attitude we take. We don't lament what we haven't done. We plan for the future and put in programs and, and, and approaches that, that see us be able to meet that, that future. Um, and the other thing I think, I've said th I said this at ADC, but I'll say it again. My current favourite quote is still from Rosa Parks, uh, whose most famous quote was, nah, because she wouldn't get off the bus in Montgomery, Alabama when she was told to. But my second most favourite quote is, without courage, dreams die. That slightly longer, the, the slightly longer piece of that quote is, without vision, people perish. Without courage, dreams die. So we provide food to Australia and around the world. If we don't have a vision, people will perish. If we don't have courage to change, we, we will become not relevant to the future consumer. That's probably it. Thank you very much.
Oh, so I'm... I, 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 You're well ahead. I was ahead. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I sped up because I thought I had three minutes to go, but I've got three minutes plus ten minutes because it's ten minutes so of questions. So do you have anything else you want to expand on or we see a few questions? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to respond to questions, I think, Graham, and okay. if, there, if there aren't any, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make my own up and ask myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like and the other so. part, I think, as Barry mentioned, if there's anyone who's interested in the slide set and that information is perhaps worth raising that with Deanne and John so um, we can keep a record of that because I think, as I said, with so much in-depth information and such a critical topic, I think it is important that if people have that interest to um, be able to have access, which we really appreciate that opportunity. So any questions from the floor or Slido's gone, not doing that well? I know, if, could you, sorry, I'm going to force you to go take a mic. They're at, yes, really. It's a cruel world. Um, I just have one here um, as you're there. How do you galvanise community... Oh, that's yours. OK, you're on Slido. Oh, well, Claire, you're way ahead. That's, that, that's actually the, the, the perfect question because I would have dwelled on that a little longer. Um, so I'm not naive and I suppose some of the, the setup slides that, that I was showing earlier um, were important. Um, so there's no question in the Bega Valley that Bega cheese has an enormous influence across the valley because we are by far the largest employee in the, in, in the region, employer in the region, um, and we've been there a very long time. If you add to that that I'm a um, fifth generation and my son Andrew is a sixth generation, I always jokingly say Andrew's got six children under eight, so there will be a seventh generation, but I did buy him a television for Christmas because he just needs to stop it. But, uh, but, um, but, 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 but that said, you know, the environmental programs that Bega Cheese introduced 10 years ago, and this is what I say about community expectations. So 10, 15 years ago, we began to fund and encourage uh, or co-fund, along with government and our farmers, um, things like uh, river and wetland preservation, um, uh, environmental studies on farms. So we, so we took our farmers from not wanting to be visited by the EPA to, to welcoming the EPA because they wanted to show their latest environmental project. And because they knew they were ahead of what the community expected. They knew they were well ahead and they could be proud of what they were doing around environmental. Interestingly, they always spent way more money than, um, than, that, than we were contributing. But they then added, a decade later, they look at the value they've added to their farm and it's been enormous. And so, so we had a level of credibility that when we walk on farms, um, People don't have a mistrust. They have a trust of us. We have a reputation that's 100 years in the making, and that reputation includes um, the council um, because, you know, they obviously see that we're very, very good corporate citizens. Um, I would go further years and years and years ago when I used to have dairy farmer meetings, I'd get the oyster growers to come along and I'd shout the dairy farmers and the oyster growers dinner because I knew that if I kept lecturing the dairy farmers about not messing up the river because it'll destroy the estuary and it'll ruin somebody else's business, they'd hear me, but they wouldn't feel it. But if they're sitting beside them, the guy that became their mate because he's grown their oysters, they go, oh, I can't, I, you know, he's a great guy, I can't, I can't or she's a, a great person, I can't, I can't ruin their business. So we created that whole view of community. The thing about circularity is that you can't be circular alone. You have to have them all. So I've got the forestry industry involved because we've got a big forestry industry in, in, in the Bega Valley. So there's no question that Bega's influence, the Bega, the Bega Group's influence, could bring lots of people together and I could ask some of my big mates to help. That was really important um, and that's really how we galvanised the community. Now, I know that's unique to the Bega region, which is why I started saying we've got to do it here. We've got to do it here because we've got all these advantages. Do I think that once we've got the proof of concept, others will pick it up and follow? They might only take the pieces that are, that are suitable to them. But I think once you get success, success naturally follows. The starting is the hard piece um, and we did have some advantages. So, so really that's how, we, that, that's how we brought it together. We brought it together because we started with like-minded people and, and, and to put it another way, um, 
I got the people that I knew, knew people that I didn't know, and, and, and put them around me and then said, can you get these people? Because we're going to need them all. And you know what? Human nature, human nature is to help. That's what human nature is. So, so we, should, we should never forget on those many attempts to walk across countries, guess what, I've got into trouble over, uh, over the years in some pretty unusual places. Never have I experienced anybody that when it comes down to the core of people, if you ask them for help, they'll help, especially if you've got a positive story to tell. So, so you know, part of, part of getting this together has been able, is, is the capacity to, to voice the story, create the vision, create an imagination. People, of course, want to be involved with something they see as being successful. Thanks, Barry. Another question from David Nation is, uh, apart from the new centre, what will be the most obvious thing people will see in the Valley about circularity? So interesting, David, we are, and this is going to sound a bit corny, but, but we are going to do this. So the, 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 uh, we are... I've just seen the next question. I'm not <laughs> sure whether I'm going to go through fine. that one. We are, it's fine. We, we, we um, will start getting circular business, so we're running circular accelerators, so we will literally begin to label the valley circular. So you'll start to see the dairy farms with circular signs on them saying this is a circular farm, and, and you know, there'll obviously be a criteria around that. But some of the things that you will really notice, which you already notice, which I think is, is what a lot of the consultants say, when you, you arrive in the valley, you will see every waterway treed. You will see every every wetland protected, uh, and that a lot of that work's already been done, and it's been done beyond dairy now. Um, and and so so as soon as you drive down the the road with any sort of sustainability consultant, um, they immediately start noticing, especially when you get out in the back roads, that every waterway is fenced, every every, every road has has windbreaks along it, um, um, and there are biodiversity links that sit there. One of the big projects where we're actually, and this will surprise people, we're actually getting legislative change. You'll probably see 50 very large water storages across the valley in the next decade. Um, because interestingly, um, we don't necessarily subscribe to one large dam at the, at the top of catchments. We're really happy in a catchment like the Bigger Valley to create a whole series of 500 megalitre dams with a, with a lighter footprint, um, but a greater level of water storage capacity. And interestingly, when we put out the expressions of interest, we got an enormous response to, to the fact that farmers, of course, recognise that we're in a time of change. We'll probably have more extreme weather events. And the thing that's been really interesting for me is that as we pitched this to the state government, um, and I, won't, I shouldn't tell tales out of school, but I've gone too far, so I will, um, the, the New South Wales water, the strategic side of New South Wales water said this is a fantastic project. Uh, we will make it our top three priorities for the next five years. The licensing side of New South Wales water said we're not going to license you for any of it. Um, and so we've had this nice argument within New South Wales water, which saved us arguing. You know, so, but, but we, will get the, we will get the change. And, and, um, and it's, that will be extraordinary as you see that water storage network come across the valley. I think it, it, it will be something that will look beautiful as well, funny enough. So we've got some really good examples that work. Um, so those, those things will be really physically evident. Um, but you'll slowly but surely see a little miniature plastic recycling centre that will probably take all our plastics and uh, you'll see farm posts that are circular with the little Indigenous circular logo on them that are at the front gate of, 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 every, of every property as we, as we take them across. You will probably see uh, more vegetation because all the marginal land that we are talking to people about will return to its natural state and look for the credits because they're not earning any money out of a handful of beef cattle or whatever else they might be running on them. So do things like that. Barry, it looks like Anonymous is decided to throw a question. Fargate milk price predictions yeah. for 23, 24. Yeah, so this is not so circular? Oh, nobody, or nobody would have wanted to know that. Nobody cares, do they? <laughs> oh, my. It's, um, it's, um, so for 23 years, I've been setting Farmgate milk price, right? Mm. And, um, and I guess I, I, um, I started 
this presentation the way I would in, 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 intend to go on. Jeff Hodges was joking with me last night that one of my favourite little sayings is, uh, the truth sets you free. And so we know the truth. The truth globally is that all the gains that were made in last year's global commodity prices have, uh, price rises have been lost. So from a global commodity point of view, market doesn't look anywhere near as sexy as it did this time last year. Uh, and the currency is, is helping offset a little, but, but, but not that much. From a domestic point of view, all those price rises that we had to drive through into the domestic market are there and holding. And Australia will be a combination of domestic returns, international returns, and quite frankly, competition. We are disconnected from global pricing at Farmgate in Australia at the moment. Um, and, but I don't want to, I, it's too early for me to make a prediction, but I don't want to um, create a sense of gloom. Um, but, but it, you know, stability or a, or, or, or a small coming off of pricing would be, would be, would be what I would expect. Um, but we are, we are months out. The, 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 the global commodity cycle, cycle tends to move through a calendar year. So what's happened, um, I'm, I'm giving you a bit more information, but here we go. Um, what's, happening, what's happened is um, Europe produced more milk than we thought. The US did what it always does. It responds to global pricing. China's been in lockdown. Japan demand's been mooted. Uh, price, price, uh, tolerance, if you like, in the poorer countries around Asia has caused a, lock, a lack of demand. So when people say the more thing, you know, what's different? Well, guess what? Nothing's different. The one thing we cannot hide from is global supply and demand. And it's a fine balance. And at the moment, supply is outstripping demand because of that very strong northern hemisphere spring and, and the response to those very high prices from the northern hemisphere. The, yeah. the market will begin to assess what the southern hemisphere looks like over the next few months, and that might see a rebalancing of some of that market as we move closer to June, which is why nobody in my position can go, this is what the number will be. But all the signs are, it's pretty mooted at the moment, but I think it'll be off, that, 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 that sort of mooted outcome will be somewhat offset by the fact that we've got exposure to the Australian domestic market uh, and competition will, will, will drive a little bit more of a premium than, than, than what the market really probably justifies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, um, you had a question about animal genetics and breeding technologies. I'm gonna potentially handball that to a certain speaker, uh, Dr. Jenny Price and a little bit right there. And Majid, who's not with us, and Mark, Mark, you just have to take your question about can the Beagle Valley continue the food producing area it is now in, as it is now into climate uncertainty of the future. I'm sure you'll have a little discussion off stage regarding that one. So I'd just like to everyone thank Barry for his contribution and thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.